Goedenavond en welkom bij Pink TV. Pink is het jaarlijkse congres dat in Zeis wordt gehouden en waar uh, denkers, doeners en dromers van over de hele wereld uh, verzameld worden. Mensen die het verschil maken en die hebben 20 minuten om hun verhaal te vertellen aan het al daar verzamelde publiek. En Pink in samenwerking met het gesprek brengt deze uh, mooie spreekbeurt er nu op de buis. De man achter Pink is Peter van Lindonk. En je zit weer naast me. En we hebben weer twee hele mooie sprekers. En de eerste is al een van mijn persoonlijke favorieten. Maar wie is het ook alweer? Susan Greenfield. Uh, sorry, barones ah. Susan Greenfield. Toen Van Adel. We... Nee, nee. Ja, we schreven een mail aan haar, Ingrid, uh, om haar uit te nodigen. En toen kwam er van haar secretaresse terug dat of hem even opnieuw wilde sturen, want het was barones Susan Greenfield. Ze zit namelijk in het Hogerhuis en in Engeland, dat is een heel slim okay. systeem, benoemt men mensen in het Hogerhuis die niet door een politieke kleur worden gekozen, maar omdat ze kennis hebben van iets waarvan ze zeggen dat is nuttig dat yeah. die in de Kamer zitten. Zou een goed idee van Nederland <laughs> trouwens ook zijn. En zij kwam, ik had de tip van een vriendin, Marijke Bezems, die stuurde mij Vanity Fair, het blad. En daar stond ze in, heel gek wijfie, uh, kort courage rokje, uh, gekke achtergrond, uh, vader elektricien, moeder uh, danseres, revue-danseres. Maar uitgegroeid tot een van de allergrootste hersenspecialisten van Engeland. Mm -hmm. uh, farmacologie er gestudeerd, is er ook professor in. Uh, en misschien het belangrijkste, ze was eh, directeur van de Royal Institution. Dat was in 200 jaar niet gebeurd. Wat de Royal Institution, dat is zoiets als wij de, de, de Koninklijke de, de Nederlandse zijn. Academie van Wetenschappen. Maar het was nog nooit gebeurd dat er een vrouw daar Aha. aan het hoofd stond. En daar was zij de eerste. Dus van. dit is de, de Britse evenknie van Robert Dijkgraaf ja, eigenlijk. Ongeveer. Maar dan ja. ietsje sexier. Ja, iets sexier. En ze praat ook wat sneller, dat zou je zien. Aha. Want ja. waar gaat ze het over hebben nog even? Over hersens. Oké, okay, laten we kijken naar Suzanne. Susan Greenfield. This is the first conference I've been to where there was no obvious thing, because normally I go to science meetings. I think it's that we are all individuals, all with our different stories to tell. And I think perhaps this is the most important thing about being a human being, that we are individuals, and that's why we're all here. Similarly, as a neuroscientist, for me, this is part of the issue and perhaps part of the problem and part of the excitement of standing on the brink of the 21st century because I feel that this notion of individuality that we prize so highly might actually for the first time be due for a makeover, which is why I've called this talk someone, anyone, and nobody. What do I mean by that? Well, let's first look at the, the somebody option. Well, by someone, let's take someone like George Bernard Shaw. Um, of course, one could take many great creative people. This just happens to be a picture I like because here he is in the autumn of his years, yet very reassuringly um, is still very lucid or was still very lucid. And yet the writings, which some of you may know, were just a pale echo of what was going on behind those piercing eyes. Who knows what it was like to see the world as someone, someone like George Bernard Shaw? Who knows what it's like to see the world as you are currently seeing it? However close you are to someone, however much you love them, however articulate you are, however poetic, however musical, no one, no one, no one can hack into your head and see the world through your eyes. So if you were to take a cleaver now to um, George Bernard Shaw, or indeed to your neighbor, or uh, someone you love, you might not want to do that, but if you did, this is what they would look like sideways on. Um, and this is what fascinated me when I first did neuroscience at Oxford, was this notion that you could hold a brain as we had to in dissection in one hand and reflect that if you got a bit under your fingernail, would that be the bit that somebody loved with? <laughs> would it be a memory? <laughs> it does drive you mad, actually, if you think about this. It drives you mad. Um, and so you either have to become a neuroscientist or, or go mad or both. Usually it's both. You know, so. Um, so basically, this is the essence, and this is why I was so fascinated by Professor Barker's brilliant exposition, because in a sense it's the same idea, is this is a bit of your body that you would not readily or easily or without question interchange with someone else's bit of their body, whereas your heart or your lungs uh, might, if you need to, to save your life and you're transplanted. Again, whilst we've seen this wonderful advance with face transplants, as yet, perhaps Professor Barker's working on this next, no one wants a brain transplant. Or perhaps you would like someone else to have a brain transplant. That's it. <laughs> Most other people, but not yourself, of course, because, because this, is, this is the essence of you. Now, where do we start as a neuroscientist to understand how your brain has become so personalized, unlike your liver or your heart? Well, the good news is compared to, say, a goldfish, 
when you are born, you are born with pretty much all the brain cells you all have, but you'll see from here, it is the growth of the connections. I cannot stress this enough. The growth of the connections between the brain cells that accounts for the growth of the brain after birth. So here you have the newborn, three-month, 50-month, and two-year-old human brain, and the white blobby bits of the brain cells and the stringy bits of the connections. So can you see these connections have grown? Now, this is what makes you different from a goldfish, and I hope I don't offend any goldfish owners here. Uh, but if you had a goldfish, and the goldfish were to die, uh, as they do, and uh, your kids were at school, then you could sneak off to the shop and buy another goldfish and the kid would come back and you, they wouldn't know any difference, let's be honest. Um, you couldn't do that with a pet cat or a dog, and you certainly couldn't do it, even though they might want you to, um, with their brothers or sisters. And as, um, <laughs> because as we shift away from the, the absolutely rigid repertoire determined by instinct, the genetic imperative, such as is uh, enjoyed by the goldfish, as we shift from instinct to learning, so we get room for adjustment, adaption, and variation. And this is why we, as a species, occupy more ecological niches than any other on the planet, because what we do very well, we're not very strong, we don't see very well, we don't hear very well, we don't smell very well, what we do brilliantly is learn. And this ability to adapt, thanks to our brain, which grows, postnatally is what makes us so special. Now, what happens is if you are an individual, guess what? You've had individual experiences, and that's why. An experience leaves its mark literally on your brain connections. So even if you are a clone, that's to say an identical twin, you will have a unique configuration of brain cell connections that are constantly upgraded every moment you're alive because they're influenced by what happens to you. Let's see the basis for that, and I turn here to the rodent because there's not that many people volunteering for neuroscience experiments who are going to give up their brain cells afterwards. Um, so what you see here um, are our friends, the lab rats. Um, this is a so-called enriched environment, and this doesn't mean to say they've been flown off to the Caribbean or anything like this. Uh, they are simply luxury for a rat. Um, is uh, ladders and wheels and the like with which they interact, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, rats are highly interactive creatures, compared to their counterparts here in a humane but so-called isolated environment with food and water. Um, these are adult rats even, which makes this study even more remarkable, because when you compare a single brain cell from each of these two, you find something quite astonishing. At first glance, for those of you, I assume the 99.9% .9 of the people in the audience who are not neuroscientists, you won't see immediately. But if you look at the blobby bit here, this is the main part of the neuron, the brain cell. The critical issue are these branches that emanate from the brain cell. And can you see these are sparser branches than here? Now, why is that important? It's important because when you make brain connections, the connections come in onto these branches. It follows the greater the surface area of those branches, the more connections you can make. So here we see what's happened is two rats, well, lots of rats, but two different groups, exposed on the one hand to an ordinary environment, the other to more interactive ladders and wheels and so on. That has changed the brain. It has changed the physical brain. We're not talking here in metaphors or in any philosophical term. We are talking in terms of the squalor of the biological brain. And what's physically happened in this real world is that these dendrites, these branches, have proliferated, meaning that the rats that are so stimulated can make more connections. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important if we turn to us, is the ages of man, or indeed of women, a charming Swedish lithograph showing the decline that sometimes awaits us, but not inevitably. And that actually can be mirrored in terms of your brain cell. This is the embryo, the fetal, and the uh, early postnatal and the mature human brain cell. Again, these blobby bits are the main parts of the cell. But what has changed as the person has grown, as you grow, is that these branches grow, enabling you to make connections. Then what's happened is this is developing senescence and senility where they have chopped back. Now, that doesn't always happen. There's ways of getting around that by stimulating the brain and offsetting it, but it can happen. So you see that getting old can mirror being very young. So what happens, rather interestingly, is that you are born, in the words of the great psychologist William James, into a booming, buzzing confusion, where you evaluate the world in terms of how sweet, how fast, how cold, how bright, but gradually, these sensations will coalesce into a face or an object, and that face or object would trigger um, more associations as it features in your life. Let's say your mother's face, the more it features, the more covert associations will be triggered, the more that face will mean something to you. Significance is the proliferation, in my view, of connections. The more connections, the deeper or bigger.